Greetings. So yesterday morning, uh, which is to say the morning of uh, Friday, September the 23rd, I uh, briefly jumped on the Clubhouse app while commuting to work. Right? You know, I was on the train and uh, I got a notification uh, stating that Garfield, actually Garfield Reed, was in a discussion with a fascinating title. Uh, and the title was, Does the Bible Agree with Evolution? And you can see the title of the room at the top of your screen there. And so, you know, that title fascinated me. And so, you know, I attempted to participate in the discussion, again, while commuting to work. And, you know, unfortunately, uh, what I said was first uh, interrupted because I, I lost reception <laughs> because the train I was on went into a tunnel. And then later on, you know, when I got back on the app, I had to jump off uh, yet again, you know, shortly thereafter to attend to work-related matters, right? I was getting calls from the office. Uh, but nonetheless, I wanted to play a little bit of the discussion. And then afterwards, I wanted to attempt to quickly supplement that with a bit of you know, at least a raw look at the Hebrew text of the verses which I referenced in that discussion. And so this video, you know, it's it's my intention that this video could serve as a bit of a preliminary look at the subject, you know, like a, a preliminary scratching of the surface, and then maybe we can have uh, more detailed discussions in the future, right? Now, admittedly, as I said, it's going to be raw, so it's going to be a bit sloppy as, you know, in the clubhouse clip that I'm going to play, at first I'm talking while riding on a train, and then when I come back on, I'm talking while I'm, you know, like walking down the street to the office, and, you know, so, so again, the, 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 the clip itself is going to be a bit sloppy, and then after that, you know, after I play the clip, I'm just going to turn my camera on and, you know, and, and, and try to run through the verses that I, that I discussed, that I referenced, that I mentioned, that I alluded to in that clubhouse discussion. So forgive me if this is all a bit raw, but, you know, September is always the busiest month of the year for me, so my time is, is limited. But I got up this morning and, you know, I, I just wanted to make this video really quickly, as quickly as possible. And perhaps, like I said, in the near future, I can take my time and make a more composed and careful video or series of videos relevant to the subject, right? You know, because actually uh, the, the topic of reconciling modern science in the book of Genesis has long been a topic of interest to me. Uh, and I was actually long been thinking of making videos, uh, you know, responding to people like Zachar Nayak, you know, people who say that there are scientists scientific errors uh, in, in Genesis. But that, that's a discussion for another time, but I'm just mentioning that because that'll probably come up in, in future videos, you know, God willing. Now, before I play this clip from the discussion, I want to make clear and, and note that this is a publicly available discussion, right? Replays were on for that discussion, and the link to the discussion is going to be available in the video description, right? So anyone can listen to this discussion in its entirety. I just wanted to make that clear so I'm not sharing some private, you know, conversation in case anyone was wondering. Uh, moreover, I included the clock or, you know, the timestamps from the discussion, and you can see that at the bottom of the screen, and I included that because I'm only showing portions of you know, from the discussion, which I felt were relevant to the to the topic. So I'm going to, you know, jump around a little bit, right? Because you see, I jump on initially at about 24 minutes into the discussion. And then I lost reception because again, the train I was on went into a tunnel. And then when I jump back on, you know, less than 15 minutes later, uh, you know, so I, I take out you know, those 15 minutes. And, and also there was more, there was like a bit more discussion between the moderators and the, the one gentleman who was disagreeing with me that I don't include here because, you know, they were discussing issues of decorum, right? They, you know, the moderators were asking that gentleman not to interrupt people and they had a bit of back and forth on that. Uh, so, you know, again, I included the clock so that people could get a sense of where to go in the full discussion, if they want to hear the full discussion, you know, where to go to hear the portions which are not included here, right? I hope that's clear. Uh, also, in this portion that you're going to hear, the gentleman who is disagreeing with me will be speaking for significantly longer stretches than me, so you'll be hearing more from him than from me, right? And I hope that's okay. Uh, now, with that said, you know, without further ado, let's go ahead and play the relevant portions of the discussion. And, you know, this is going to run for about 22 minutes. And after that, I'll try to briefly take a look at some relevant Hebrew text, you know, both the biblical text and maybe a few uh, rabbinic commentaries. It's my turn. Yeah, yeah, on you. Go ahead, bro. Okay, no, all I was going to say was uh, there's a bunch of different things to say here, but I jumped in because I saw the title, you know, Does the Bible Agree with Evolution? So I was guessing this uh, room was making room for sort of a theistic evolution uh, right, framework. Exactly, right, exactly, right. You're right. And what I was going to say, so regarding, you know, this idea of like, 
can like a, a, a bunch of boulders come together to put a building or something like that together, it really would depend on the framework that we're starting with, right? So if we're starting with a completely like naturalistic explanation where we're not invoking anything supernatural, uh, if we're only looking for natural explanations, it would seem that the process of hereditary change over time provides the best natural explanation for the, the range of biodiversity we have on our planet today, right? In the terms of our available natural ex uh, explanations, however uh, uh, insufficient they may be. But if we're bringing in a theistic framework, I don't see what would preclude God from being able to do that. There's nothing absurd about God taking boulders and turning them to, into buildings or taking, you know, much simpler organisms and, you know, making them much more complex. That's what I would say. Uh, one interesting point about the question about whether it's compatible with the Bible, while, of course, the Bible doesn't lay, uh, ah, forgive me, I'm running, I'm on a train, I'm going into a tunnel, I'll pick this up in a, in a little bit, sorry about that, forgive me. No, we hear you, man, you're good, we hear you loud and clear, I don't know that, oh, he must have lost, uh, he must have, he's going to lose uh, service or something, some of those trains, yo. I, uh. Still have a comment about evolution, if that's still on the table. Yeah, go ahead, bro. Cause yeah, cut yeah, out. Sorry about that. I was on a minute ago, and I uh, was uh, got that. I went into a tunnel, so I didn't get to finish what I was saying. Real quick on the question of compatibility of the Bible and the theory of evolution. One fascinating text is uh, uh, Isaiah forty-two five. Now it might not be entirely clear from uh, from an English translation. But the text, when it talks about God uh, creating the heavens and uh, expanding the heavens and, bear with me one second, creating the heavens and expanding the heavens and uh, creating the, the creatures on the earth and, and spreading them out or, or working them over, however you want to put it, the text in Hebrew uses a series of active participles, right? So it can be understood as stating that God is the creator of the heavens and the one who expands, expands them. Or, because it's an active participle, it can be understood as present tense, meaning God is in the process of expanding the heavens. And then, by the same token, if we're interpreting the active participles that way, <coughs> then God could also be in the process, actively, of developing the earth and the organisms that are on it. And so while Isaiah 42.5 doesn't necessitate... Uh, agreeing with the theory of evolution, I think it loans itself well to being interpreted harmoniously with it. I don't know. I'm, and so I, I've always found that to be an interesting question. Uh, is Not so much does the Bible explicitly endorse no, evolution, but can wrong. the two be interpreted that's, harmoniously? And I think the answer is clearly no, yes. No, no, that's, that's wrong. The author of Isaiah and the rest of the Bible, which was Jesus Christ by the triune God, said in Matthew 19, do you not know that he made them in the beginning? Jesus was referring to Adam and Eve, okay? So so Jesus, Jesus' reference to Adam and Eve made in the beginning is absolutely ipso facto incompatible with uh, Adam and Eve were at the end of eons of time. This is a position that William Lane Craig is adopting, okay? When you actually go into his book, and by the way, for those of you who may not know, William Lane Craig is probably one of the most preeminent Christian apologists uh, alive today. He's written a book about the historical Adam, where he says Genesis 1 is mytho-history because he's attempting to harmonize it with uh, biological or Darwinian evolution. The problem with that, it's incompatible with the Bible. And when you go to William Lane Craig's book, there's only two places in the book where he references Matthew 19 and specifically the verse that deal with Adam and Eve, and there's no commentary on it. That passage, when we take a look at it, wipes out any possibility of harmonizing evolution with the Bible. Now, if you'd like to discuss it Could further, you explain I'm why? Yes, because he said he made Adam and Eve in the beginning. When we go back to Genesis 1, it is clear from the grammar and syntax that we're talking about normal 24 hour days. It says the Hebrew word yom that's used for day, okay, is usually refers, means a 24 hour period, but not always throughout the Old Testament. But when it is accompanied with there was evening and morning, 
a first day. There was evening and morning a second day. The number, when it's accompanied with an ordinal, it always means a normal human day. In Exodus, I believe it's 20 or 22. I think it's 20. Moses reiterates this, okay, in the, in the Ten Commandments, where he says, and God made the world in seven days, and then you will rest, and he rested on that seventh day, and you will rest on the seventh day. It could not be more clear. The reason why people are attempting to try to harmonize the theory of evolution with the Bible is not because they can be harmonized, it's because they are intimidated because at the theory of evolution, as garbage as it is, has metastasized throughout the entire world, and there is a prevailing widespread consensus that it, that it, is, that it is true. But if you study anything from the, histor the history and philosophy of science, it will show is that prevailing paradigms uh, uh, in the past have been, re have been um, uh, rejected and new paradigms replace them. The fact that we have a pervasive paradigm that purely mechanistic occurrences that were fortuitous resulted in an ever increasing complexity in biology, okay, that doesn't make it true. Okay, so evolution is incompatible with a biblical worldview. Actually, may I, may I respond to that? Go ahead. Yeah, so I was going to say, uh, regarding Genesis 1 and the use of the word yom, there's nothing in Genesis 1 itself that necessitates that a yom is a 24-hour period. Because one of the interesting things is that yom is used to refer to the expansion of light. So in a sense, the yom of Genesis 1 could be a pre-terrestrial or non-terrestrial yom, not necessarily a day like on Earth. That's I'm number not, one. I'm not, I'm oh, wait, hold on, wait, I'm not done yet. I'm not done yet. Uh, can you number two. Okay, let, let, let him finish. Yes, yes, let I'm, finish. I'm, 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 I'm dark, dark, let him finish. So this, as for evening and morning, that's what you get from an English translation. The Hebrew text says erev and boker, right? And yes, that can mean evening and morning, but something that's been pointed out even by medieval exegetes is that it can also mean mixing and splitting, right? The, uh, the, the, the verb uh, erev can refer to mixing and boker can refer to splitting. So again, this could, it could refer to uh, an evening and morning or it could refer to a non-terrestrial erev, mixing, and boker, splitting. So again, there's nothing in Genesis 1 necessitating that the yom is a 24-hour period. Beyond that, then when we go beyond that, if as far as saying that the seventh day Sabbath for humans, or at least for Israelites, is based on the seven uh, yomim of, of, of Genesis, so too there's also like sabbatical years where like when you're dealing with, say, like crops, you know, something goes for six years and then on the seventh year you let a certain amount of land to lay fallow. The, the point is, is that while it's set, while the seven days of creation or the seven yoms of creation set an analogy for periods of seven that apply to human beings, the analogy doesn't necessitate that the yom in Genesis 1 is a 24-hour day. Yeah, you're just trying to evade the plain grammatical meaning of the text, okay? You're attempting to harmonize the prevailing consensus view that the earth and the universe is, is old. So in an act of desperation, you're, you're trying to extract from Genesis a way of escape. Now, if Adam and Eve were made at the end of unimaginable eons of time, how then could Jesus have say that they were in the beginning? Okay, this is just ridiculous, okay? You're just trying to evade the plain gramma gra grammar and syntax uh, in order to harmonize it. Do you believe that the universe is old? Yes, yes, I do. Uh, based upon what? Well, I defer to the science on that, on the popular See, science. That, I, that, could that, 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 I could be wrong. I could be wrong, but yes, I defer to precisely my point. What you are attempting to do, what you're attempting to do, okay, and I'm not trying to impugn your motives, but <laughs> what you are attempting to do is you're trying to harmonize the grammar and the syntax of the Hebrew to harmonize with the prevailing consensus. Now, when, uh, it, the, when Darwin came along, okay, he was influenced by Charles Lyell. Do you know who Charles Lyell was? No, I do not. But to be fair, what I okay. said had nothing to do with Darwin. It's not, it doesn't hinge okay. on anything oh, to do it with Darwin. It most certainly does, and I'll tell you why. Would you like to know why? 
So just to okay. be clear, you're and saying I, that Darwin I, I, has something to do with our interpretation of the Hebrew text? Yours does. Okay, you are the byproduct of what Darwin started in the late 19th century. And would you like me to explain why? Okay, I'll tell you why, okay? Darwin was influenced by Charles Lyell. Charles Lyell was the father of modern ge geology. He's one of the few individuals is considered the father of modern geology, okay? Charles Lyell hated the mosaic account of creation. He was a lawyer by, by profession, right? But he's considered to be one of the founding fathers of modern geology. So he, so he hated it. So he decided to interpret certain uh, topographical features or geological features of the of the uh, of the Earth, not as being evidences of catastrophe, but as the product of what is called uniformitarianism. That the key to the past is the present. So that certain features like the Grand Canyon and other topographical geographical features um, are, are not uh, indicative of catastrophe, but of just long periods of time. Now, Darwin came along, and by the time Darwin got back from his trip on the Beagle, he decided to abandon the Bible. He formally had a very nominal belief in the Bible, so he was raised basically Unitarian, right? He had a nominal belief in the Bible. By the time he got back, he rejected the Bible as uh, being uh, written by God and being history. He then tried to find um, a purely materialistic, mechanistic explanation of life. Darwin did not discover anything. The idea of evolution was known as transmutation, right? What he did was, he stole an ideal, an idea from Alfred Russell Wallace, known as natural selection, that the fittest in a given environment will survive and reproduce in greater numbers and, and live on, where the weaker will, will, will not. So he combined the idea of transmutation with natural selection, and he incorporated it in his book, The Origin of the Species. Okay? Now, the secret sauce to evolution without which evolution dies on a pole is long periods of time from his perspective. You have to adopt the notion that the earth and the universe is old for the idea of evolution to have any semblance of plausibility. Once somebody accepts the theory of evolution, they will ipso facto adopt an old earthism and an old universe, okay? It necessarily follows. Now, how does that pertain to an old universe? Well, it is because of an evolutionary outlook, an evolution retrodiction. From that, people automatically adopt that the earth and the universe is old. And you can see this, for example, in um, a brief lecture by Dr. Leonard Susskind, who is a world-renowned physicist in the class of Stephen Hawking. When he was asked, does the universe expl uh, um, does the universe display intelligent design? He first made a joke uh, to the audience, and then he pointed out, no, it, it looks like it is, it, it is designed. It look biology and the universe in terms of its fine tuning down to, um, uh, you know, the, like, for example, the, the, the four physical forces. He says it looks like it's designed, right? But it's not. He says Darwin showed us the correct way to understand things. It looks like it's designed, but it's not. He says Darwin discovered, which Darwin did not discover, a mechanism uh, so that we can understand that what we see is not designed, but that, that certain me mechanistic things were put into place that make it look like designed. And he says, and one day we will discover what the mechanism is that produced what the fine tuning is, but it's not designed. So the theory of evolution historically was entrenched first, and they adopted that the earth was old rather than appealing to certain mechanistic practices. Now, when it comes to the mechanistic practices where people think the earth is old, these are based upon circular reasoning. Now, do you think that things are old because of radiometric isotope dating? 
You're asking me? Yes. Okay, so let me just point this out. Originally, you said the, the text of Genesis 1 precludes anything other than a 24-hour day. I address that by going to the Hebrew text. You've not touched on you're, my actual response. You're bastardized, instead, wait, wait, hold you're on, hold on. Wait, hold on, hold on. And oh, so you've jabbed at everything from Darwin to his precursors to, but none of that had anything to do with the Hebrew text of Genesis one. So like, honestly, this seems to not respond yeah, you can to do my this, response. You can, you, you can, no, what, you, what you're doing is an a, 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 des, a desperate attempt, okay? <laughs> Is to parse Look, the, the, I'm the, sorry, y'all. Hey, man, right I gotta there. speak, Dar. Can no, you just give me on one second? second? I'm at work. I'm at work. No, I just want to say one thing. Hold up, Dar. Hold up. Let, 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 look, let, I'm let, at work. Let, just let me say let, one thing, please. No, I'm Dar. Dar. Responding to this gentleman. That Dar, you can, but on, I just want to say Dar, one thing. Up, hold on. They have other people up there that want to say something too. So just we're gonna let you respond, bro. Just calm down. Go ahead, Kenny. Hey, man. Just real quick. My point to you is this: a designer can start something before the earth is formed he's god that's what i'm trying to tell you so my point is is this brother is telling you basically that the way the hebrew is written that it necessarily had to be 24 hours so it could be a longer process you know we i don't believe in the big thing big, big bang theory but what i do believe in is evolution right god starts the process and then everything evolves why do you from believe, there why do you believe in evolution jack what i don't know i can't read his whole name abbas abbas uh whatever the one with the Palestinian flag. Uh, he mentioned about the Hebrew concept of Yom. And when he mentioned about the Hebrew concept of Yom was, was spot on. As far as Erev, which means no, it evening. Which be, how are you going to tell me it wasn't? And I'm, and I'm trying I'll, to explain I'll, I'll it. Tell you why. Let me, could you be quiet and listen then? Erev. Erev, it does mean mixture. That's evening. Because you have a mixture between light and darkness. So Erev, what he said mid mid mix mixture was spot on and when he talked about broker and broker means you know to bring forth or to split so what he said about that concept of yom is definitely spot on and you did not you did not uh you did not meant you did not even see that concept or you didn't even speak upon that you went all the way to darwin which he wasn't even talking about so word again first of all the appeal to the grammar is special bleeding okay in in hermeneutics which is the science and the principles of interpretation okay one of the first rules that we follow is that words are to be understood in their in their in their normal usage and by context okay the interpretation that he's oh, giving of the hebrew is he's he, he simply appeal it's called excuse me it's called special pleading He's attempting to parse the words in any way to find uh, a way that he can smuggle in long periods of time, because without long periods of time, you can't you can't have evolution. OK, now, when we interpret words, when people are speaking to us, people are communicating to it, communicating to us, we interpret words according to their normal and typical grammatical usages in either their contemporary or in their historical settings. Okay, so when we go to Genesis one, when we when I'll we use you, words, when we use words in our the normal setting, you come up with a twenty four hour period. What people are trying to do is they're trying to parse the words in such a way as to rob them of their normal meaning. If you are going to say that a particular word or grammatical construction is not to be understood in its normal grammatical historical setting then you're going to have to make a definitive case for it. You just can't come along and saying, well, it's possible it could be understood this way or, or that way. OK, that's the difference between literal language and figurative language. We understand figurative language that is not literal is because we either have internal or external reasons not to interpret something in its normal grammatical way, which is it, which is literal. That's why I said it's special pleading to say that, that the, yeah, somebody has an open mic. That's why it's special pleading to say that the, the grammatical construction uh, does not have to be interpreted in its normal grammatical historical way. Special pleading, okay? That's simple. All right, uh, I got a question for you. I'm talking to Brady Bleak. I'm sorry, you speaking to me? Yes. Well, I taught me to Brad E. Brick. Ken, any man to Brad E. Brick get the nah? All right. <laughs> I guess he doesn't. So so uh, you can't really discount what he said about Young.
Yeah, what is your point? Kind of got quiet there, huh? He sounded smart as hell till just then. <laughs> yeah. The the point the point is you can you can be smug all you want, but uh, you know appealing to special pleading is a fallacy in debate. Okay, he's going to have to show that uh, what he's saying is necessary. Okay, we just showed you. No, you didn't. Yeah, we <laughs> just literally just showed you. No, he didn't. He, he, yeah, he actually did. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I guess yeah. yeah. <laughs> hey, listen. Uh, if you guys it. want to play cutesy and laugh like teenagers, I'll just go oh, elsewhere. No, it's not, it's not okay? cutesy. It's, the no, bottom line is this. The bottom well, line, do you, well, do you guys well, hold, well, you, hold, you, hold, you, hold on? Hold on, hold on, hold on. No one no one has tied your screens or, 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 or locked you to this room. You're here on your own on your own volition. Yeah, so that's correct. you can also leave on your own volition. So yeah, don't try don't try to say that we're acting yeah, like high schoolers I, or no one's acting yeah, like a are. high schooler. Yeah. You are act you are acting very immature yourself by continuing well, to not. interrupt individuals. You're interrupting me now. Yeah. No, I'm, it's I'm just, responding it's just as funny. I do in other it's just funny that you don't know how to Yeah, speak I'm not Hebrew hearing a rebuttal. You, you try to so tell my, people my how Hebrew works. Pleading. That's, that's kind of funny. That's not special pleading. That's like I'm not, I'm not hearing a rebuttal Hebrew. to my special pleading charge. You don't speak Hebrew. That's why. I don't, I don't you have don't, to. You don't even know what just happened. Yeah, you, you probably know, do. No, I'm, I'm order, very well aware. I'm very well aware that Hebrew was spoken. Yeah, I'm very well aware. That's so besides do you, the do point. You speak, do you speak Hebrew? I, I don't. I don't have to speak Hebrew in order to lay out the ground that what? words are understood. Listen, listen carefully. Wanna, okay, listen. Oh, you, wait, hold Dog, on a second. How you going to give a you defensive argument when you can't even speak the language? And now you're tolerating over talking here when you told me I couldn't over talk. Dog, how you going to give a defensive? Yeah, but you you're the only one that's been over talking. You've been over talking. Okay, I have one question, and for all of you, are you guys Hebrew Israelites? Oh, no, 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 no. See, here it comes. No. See, okay. hey, no, no, man. Look, no, wait a minute, yo. No, I, I was waiting on that. I was waiting on him to say that. Point taken. And from there, the discussion went on to other things. Uh, I myself was unable to participate further because I had gotten pulled into work-related matters. And uh, the gentleman who was disagreeing with me, he either left the room or perhaps he was uh, unfortunately booted by the moderators. I'm not certain. But whatever the case, you know, the, the discussion ended in, a, in an unfinished way, and that's why I wanted to make this video. And, and like I said, there's a link to the full discussion in the video description for anyone who wants to hear it. But here, I wanted to just add a bit more to that as, you know, sort of a preliminary note. I want to try to supplement that briefly, you know, with a, a look at the Hebrew text, uh, you know. And so uh, what I have here is uh, my copy of uh, Mikrod Gedolot, which is sort of like a rabbinic study Bible insofar that it, it has, you know, on every page it will have the biblical text. And then a couple of translations into Aramaic, and then uh, it also have the commentaries of, of various uh, rabbinic thinkers, you know, rabbinic exegetes. Now, as a disclaimer, I'm a Christian. I'm not uh, an Orthodox Jew. I'm not part of rabbinic Judaism. So, I, of course, I'm not claiming that the commentators that we're going to look at are authoritative. But I think it's interesting to see the insights that these fallible men stumbled across, you know, in the Middle Ages. And perhaps if uh, if I mention the Talmud in passing, uh, you know, even in antiquity, they, these insights cannot be described as, you know, mere attempts to reconcile the text with modern science after the fact because they were stumbling across these insights, you know, before the dawn of modern science. And so with that, I'd like to go in and start with Rashi's commentary on Genesis 1-1. Uh, and I want to do this just to sort of set the tone for interpreting, you know, uh, the, the word yom, which is going to come up later on in Genesis, uh, specifically in, uh, you know, Genesis 1-5. But just to set the tone, I, I think Rashi has this interesting grammatical point that he attempts to make. And again, I'm not saying you have to agree with him, but it's an interesting insight, right? Rashi says, uh, right? Which means, you, you know, you're not going to find the word reshit in scripture. You're not going to find a case of that in which it's not connected to the word that follows it, Right? And so the point that he's trying to make here is that the word Reshit, right? Then the relevance of this is that, you know, Genesis 1-1 begins, Bereshit uh, bara Elohim et et haaretz, right? In the beginning, it's, it's interpreted as meaning in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? But Rashi's saying that that word Reshit, every other instance of it, it's connected to the word that follows, meaning it's in the construct state, right? 
It's the, the, the reshit of, the first of the word that follows, right? Now, again, you don't have to agree with him, but the point he's trying to make is that if that's the case with every other verse, then perhaps Genesis 1-1 can be interpreted the same way. Admittedly, it's a bit more awkward to try and put you know, this noun in the construct state with a verb, but whatever the case, he's stating that even in Genesis 1-1, the word reshit is connected to the word that follows, right? So what that would mean is that you can read the first three verses of Genesis as sort of a continuous thought, right? Where it's not saying merely that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, rather it's saying in the beginning of when God created the heavens and the earth, right? And, you know, at that time, the earth was formless and void and darkness was enveloping the tehom, right? And the, the deep thing. I don't want uh, to sort of leave tehom untranslated, uh, but, it, it, you know, the word tehom can mean something deep. And, you know, a very interesting insight can be found in uh, Talmud Bavli. It's uh, tractate Chagiga 12a where it connects uh, Proverbs uh, 3.20 with the beginning of creation, where it says that, Tehomot nibka'u, you know, the, 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 the deep things were divided. You know, Tehomot is the plural of Tehom, that when the Tehoms, the, the Tehomot were divided, that that pertains to the creation of the universe, to the creation of the world. And that's interesting because it makes you wonder if, you know, it, it sort of loans itself to this insight. If you connect those two texts, then that would mean that at the beginning of the creation that the, the vague, deep thing that was being referred to was divided. But whatever the case, so in the beginning of when God created the heavens and the earth, at that time, uh, the earth was formless and void and darkness had enveloped the, the, the home and the spirit of God, Ruach Elohim Merachefet Al Pane Hamayim, right? That the spirit of God uh, was hovering or, or vibrating above the Mayim and at that time, in the beginning of this, crea this act of creation, Wayomer Elohim Yehior, Wayehior, right? God said, let there be light, and there was light. So, in a sense, one of the earliest acts of creation, at a time when the earth didn't even have a form, God said, let there be light, and then this light bursts forth, right? And then, interestingly enough, you know, God says, God said, the light, we saw the light, it was good, and... In here, it says, no, this is verse 4, Wayabdel Elohim bein haor u bein ha-choshet, right? So God divided, God separated the light from the darkness. And that's interesting because how could God separate them unless they were together, right? But it doesn't say that the darkness was on the light. What the text said was that the darkness, the choshet, was al pnei tahom. It was on the face. It was enveloping the tahom. It was enveloping that 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 deep thing, which, you know, if you go with the Talmudic insight, uh, would be divided. And, you know, when the light burst forth, the darkness was separated from it. It's, that loans itself well to the idea of this, this, this the home, this deep thing, you know, sort of being split and the light, light bursting forth from it. That's how you wind up separating the darkness from the light because the light is bursting forth from the Tehom, right? That's interesting. And, you know, that seems to have a sort of Big Bang quality to it, right? But whatever the case, in verse 5, this is what's going to connect us to the, the issue of how we interpret the word Yom in Genesis 1, right? It, it says, Wa'yikra uh, Elohim la'or Yom. And God called the light Yom. So now this is why this is significant, because at the beginning of creation, you have this, this deep thing, which, you know, at a time when the earth was, wasn't even really formed, the, the, the earth was in this formless state. The first, one of the earliest acts of creation is to have this light burst forth. And that light, which is bursting forth at the beginning of the universe, that light is called Yom. So when you talk about the Yamim, the, 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 each Yom of creation... It's not necessarily referring to terrestrial days. And not only that, we're talking about a yom that refers to the expansion of this light. The light, the expansion of that light, that pertained to yom. And if I may, I want to go to an interesting insight which was made by Nachmanides. Right, so this is uh, Nachmanides' uh, interpretation of verse 5, right? So when it says, Elohim, I'm sorry, let me make sure I make that clear, right? So it says Ramban. So this is Nachmanides who died uh, 750 years ago, right? 
And when it says, uh, you know, in verse 5, Genesis 1, 5, it says, Wa Elohim la'or yom, right? He says that, kinibra uh, hazman, because, you know, the, the time was created. And so that's, you know, he's not saying that in the way that modern minds would think, but nonetheless, it's an interesting insight. You know, the, the bursting forth of the initial light, that, that initial flash at the beginning of creation, right? That sets into motion time, and that's the sort of yom that we're referring to. We're referring to something, to a cosmic yom, a yom before the formation of the earth. And so when you think of it in that sense, that the yom that is being referred to in Genesis 1, at least the initial one, is referring to, you know, this expansion of light. In that sense, you don't have to think of a yom as a 24-hour day. And that's interesting. But one more insight uh, now from the same commentator, from Nachmanides. Uh, you know, remember there was the thing where, you know, there was... a. Uh, Yehi erev we yehi boker yom echad, right? There was, as you know, the popular English translations, there was evening and there was uh, morning, right? That's the popular translation. There was erev and there was boker. And uh, regarding that, uh, uh, Gerald Schrader, in his uh, book from 30 years ago, Genesis and the Big Bang, on page 101, he made an interesting statement about this. He said, the compartmentalization of the events of our Genesis into days bracketed by Erev and Boker, or evening and morning, is convenient for talking in the language of man. But the root meanings of the words hold the secret. I think that's a, a very interesting point, and Nachmanides stumbles across that as well. So this is what he says, right, about these, uh, about Erev and Boker. And so he himself notes the, you know, the, the roots the etymologies of these words, right? As he's attempting to understand them, right? So he says, uh, right? The, the beginning of the, of the night is called Erev, on account of or because, right? The, the images or the, the colors or the forms, they mix themselves together in it, right? So now notice the root here, right? Sheyit arbu, you have that ayin resh bet, and then you also have ayin resh bet in Ereb, right? So he connects, Nachmanides connects the word Ereb with this verb, yit arbu, right? Which means, you know, they mix themselves, right? Because the, the word Ereb comes from a root that pertains to verbs meaning to mix. And so this can be understood as meaning mixing, Right, and then he goes on to say, with regards to, uh, he says, tehilat uh, hayom in the beginning of the day, boker. It's called boker. Sheyebaker adam benotam, because God, because man, yebaker, man divides between them. Right, man divides between the days. Now, again, this is sort of a medieval mind struggling with the etym the etymology of these words, but nonetheless, note again that. Boker, right? Beit kof resh, and then the verb yebaker has that same root, beit kof resh, because Nachmanides recognized that boker pertains to splitting, pertains to dividing. And so, you know, when the text talks about erev and boker, just as the yom doesn't have to be a terrestrial day, so too the erev and boker don't have to be a terrestrial erev and boker. If you were to read those words hyperliterally, you could read them as mixing and splitting, right? And, you know, if you think about that, that sort of, you know, fits well with the early creation of the universe, right? That at the, bare, at the start of creation, you have this to home, you have this deep thing, and then, you know, and there's, it's enveloped in darkness, and a flash of light bursts forth from it, right? And the darkness is separated from it, and then... Within that process, that, that early state of the universe, you have Ereb and Boker. You have the mixing and the splitting, right? And you can think about that, about, you know, about, you know, new uh, atoms or even new elements coming into, into formation and, and atoms splitting and so forth. You know, you have this situation where the universe 
items within the early primordial universe are splitting apart, coming together, and, you know, that's the early evolution of the universe. And so I hope that's clear. That's what I was attempting to allude to in that discussion, and maybe in the near future I'll, you know, make a, a video where I take my time and, and show this more clearly. But uh, the point I was trying to make is that when you look at the Hebrew text, you don't have to think of, you know, the Yom as a terrestrial day, and you don't have to think of the Ereb and Boker as terrestrial morning and terrestrial evening, you know, or, or evening and morning, respectively. Uh, rather, you can read these texts as, you know, the Yom refers to the, the, the time that comes into existence with the initial flash of light, the initial expansion of light, and the Ereb and Boker are, you know, these these mixings and splittings, you know, these mixings and divisions that are happening as the universe unfolds. And now, if I may, I'd like to go to Isaiah and close this out with that. I just want to show the Hebrew text of Isaiah 42.5, which was the one other thing I discussed. I, I find this fascinating. So here we are, you know, we're in Isaiah, and again, this is chapter 42, and I'm just going to be looking at verse 5, right? Which, when talking about the Lord, talking about, you know, the Lord, or Yahweh, if you will, right? It says of, 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 of the Lord, Bore hashamayim when notehem, right? And now, bore and note are active participles. So an active participle can be understood two different ways, right? It can be understood as referring to the one who engages in the action of the verb, or... It can be treated as a present tense uh, conjugation or present tense rendering of the verb, right? So, for example, Rashi, he talks a lot about, you know, lashon hove, right? The, or hove in, in modern Hebrew, right? Like you have the verb lihiot, uh, right? To be, and then hove is the, the active participle of lihiot, right? So, Rashi uses the, the, the phrase lashon hove to, to mean uh, the present tense, literally the language of hove, the language of of what is, right? And because hoe takes the same form as bore and note, right? So these are active participles. So while you can understand this as meaning that the Lord is, if we treat it as the one who engages in the action, it can mean the creator of the heavens and the spreader of them, right? But because these verbs, because active participles can be understood as the verb in the present continuous text, it can also mean that the Lord is creating the heavens and is expanding them. That's a fascinating aspect of this text, right? That the biblical text at Isaiah 42, 5, if it's interpreted literally as in the present tense, it can be understood as stating that God is currently expanding the heavens, right? And, and we know that's actually true, right? The universe is still expanding. So that's a fascinating part of, of, of Genesis, uh, excuse me, of Isaiah, that Isaiah 42, 5 can be interpreted as meaning that God is, you know, expanding the heavens, right? Notehem, he's expanding them. But now, if we're interpreting the active participles that way in this text, we go to the next line, right? Which says, Rokaha aretz, witzeetzaheha, right? Uh, that, you know, God is, uh, again, this is an active participle, at least if we understood it and in, in, understand it in the sense of the, of the nikudot, right? It might be a little bit more open to interpretation if you don't read it in light of the nikudot, but whatever the case, so I'm going to read it in light of the, the, the Nikudot, right? And read this as an active participle, right? So that now this uh, root, raqa, uh, right, can mean to stretch, to spread, to beat out, like if you're working over a piece of metal, right? So, but it says that, that God is doing this to the earth and to its aeha, right? To the, the things which, which come forth from it. And this is interesting because... I would take th this idea of, you know, whether you want to interpret the verb as meaning uh, stretching or beating out or working it over like the way you work a piece of metal as more generally meaning developing, right? That God is developing the earth and that which came forth from it. And so this text can be interpreted as meaning that God is still expanding the universe and God is still developing not only the earth, but the living things upon it, the plants, the animals, etc. And therefore, you know, as I said in that discussion, you know, uh, I, I wouldn't say that you have to believe that the biblical text explicitly refers to something like uh, evolution, you know, the process of hereditary change over time. But I do think the text can be interpreted harmoniously 
with this idea of at least a number of living things on Earth still undergoing development continuously from the, their, you know, from the inception of, of living things unto this day, God continues to develop them. And, you know, I think that's interesting, and that's why I think the, the, the text can be interpreted harmoniously with, uh, you know, with this idea of hereditary change over time, at least explaining some of the, the biodiversity on our planet. And, of course, there's a lot more nuance to be brought in. There's a lot of questions to be answered, but I figured this would make for a good uh, introduction to the subject. And uh, God willing, I'll get into this and, you know, in, in future, de you know, in more detail in future videos. So on that note, I, uh, I hope you found this uh, hastily thrown together video uh, interesting. And uh, this is definitely an instance where uh, I think we can have a lot more discussion in the comment section. So, of course, I'm looking forward to comments, questions, criticisms, you know, uh, share your thoughts. And on that note, God bless.